Hey folks, I'm Demotro and welcome back to my combo classroom. Or today, I guess, my little combo corner or whatever. I'm filming this lesson indoors because it's a little hard to film in an outdoor classroom when it's raining. Hey folks, welcome back to combo class. I'm here. In any case, today I want to teach those of you who don't know about the level beyond exponents, a level called tetration that's not taught enough in schools and not talked about enough in general. In fact, there's not even a good standardized notation for it, but it's a powerful tool and something that might pop up in our future lessons, so I want to make sure you understand exactly what tetration can do. Now, when applying operations between numbers, it might seem like there's many possible levels beyond exponents that you could go to, but really there's one that's the most logical, and that's because exponents themselves come in a kind of chain of operations. And we're gonna start way at the beginning of that one, even before addition, on one called succession, meaning just adding one to a number. Might seem too basic to be useful, but when you're defining arithmetic, it's good to start at the most basic level possible, which is going to the successor of a number. Now, addition is repeating that succession operation a certain amount of times. Like A plus B means A plus B times you do that succession operation. Now, moving past addition, which we can consider like level one of this chain, on to level two, multiplication, we essentially need to just repeat the last operation again. A times B means B times we are adding A's. And going from level one to level two does have some changes, like the additive identity element that doesn't change things is zero, whereas the multiplicative identity element is one. So there are some differences on these levels, but in many ways, multiplication is just repeated addition. Now to move from the second level of multiplication up to level three, exponentiation, all we have to do is repeat the last operation Operation. Instead of now making B copies of A added, we're making B copies of A multiplied. Because A to the power of B really just means A times A times A, B times. We've repeated the last operation. Now to move up from exponentiation, which we're also gonna add a new notation for because using these upward arrows can be a way to signify these further hyper operations. Exponentiation meant B copies of A multiplied. So why not take B copies of A as exponents? And that's exactly what tetration is, repeated exponentiation making a tower of a to the a to the a to the a b times. And some of the notations used to write this tetration can be using two upward arrows, like how an exponent used one there, or like using an exponent on the front side instead of the back side to mean a tetrated to b. And we could take this further and go to level five, pentation, where we repeat tetration, a tetrated to a b times, which can be written with three upward arrows or a little three next to the arrow or other ways. Like I said, there's unfortunately not really a standardized notation for these things. And we could even go to hexation and onward. But tetration itself back on level four can make such massive numbers that we're barely gonna need to dabble in these ones today. One quick clarification is that these tetration towers read from the top downward. Like I do that part first and not that lower part first. And some people don't think that would make a difference. And maybe that's because they tried this simplest example of it. Because with twos, 
they're equal. Whether I do two to the power of that or that to the power of two. But with most other cases, like with three, they are not equal. Three to the power of that, which is 27, is different than 27 to the power of three. So if we see a tetration tower, like a to the a to the a to the a, which could be written like that, we'd first do that part, then apply it to that, then apply it to that. An interesting example of how it matters which order you read these is that although three twos doesn't matter, four twos read downward is the same result as five twos read upward. Both of them are this number in the 60,000s. Now to see how powerful these different operators can be, let's play some games with numbers. Our first game will be with a given operator and endless of some number, how big will it get? Well, on level one addition, even the number one added to itself infinitely many times would approach infinity. Same with larger numbers. But funny enough, on level two multiplication, multiplying one by itself, no matter how many times you do it, it stays stuck at one. It takes two or larger in multiplication or a larger level to approach infinity. So it seems like maybe two is the number it takes to start growing endlessly. Or is it two? Well, in our second game, we'll apply a given operation to just one of a number and another of itself and see what we get. If our numbers are zero, added to itself or multiplied to itself is still zero, and past that we get an error. We can't take zero to the zero with power or zero tetrated to zero or anything like that. One, if we add it to itself, we get two, but that's higher than the future levels because one times one is just one or one tetrated to one or future levels is still just stuck on itself. Now two plus two, we get up to four. It hops up a bit, but it stays there. Two times two is four. Two to the second power is four. Two tetrated to two or any of the future ones end up just being four. So in this game, it takes three to grow and three can grow pretty massive. Three plus three is six times three is nine, three to the third power is 27, three tetrated to three it means three to the 27th power when you break it down, and we'll see in a minute how massive that is. Three pentated to three would be a tower of three to the power of three to the power of threes, the size of three to the 27th power amount of threes, and past that would just be insane. Now, looking back just at tetration for a moment to see how big that operation can make small numbers get, we're going to see what happens when we take the numbers from one to four tetrated to the numbers up through four. And remember, this would mean the number to its own power. This would mean the number to its own power with three in the stack, and that would have four in the stack. We've seen that one just stays stuck on one, and two tetrated to two is four. But if we allow two tetrated to three, meaning two to the two to the two from the top down, we get 16. And a stack of four twos, we get that number, starting to grow, but not as fast as three can grow. Three tetrated to two is 27. Three tetrated to three, which would be three to the 27th power, is that number. And three tetrated to four, has that many digits. Four tetrated to two, we are already at 256. Four tetrated to three is bigger than the number Google, and four tetrated to four is bigger than the number Googleplex. Now let's take a brief peek at the level beyond tetration, pentation, and see how absurdly large that would make numbers. So three tetrated three, which we're using the arrow notation now to make it more similar to future levels, is that massive number. Well, three pentated three ends up breaking down to three tetrated to the amount of three tetrated to three. So we have a stack of three to the three to the threes that's that many copies tall. Even pentating something to two can be massive. 
Kind of like multiplying something by two adds its own number to itself, or taking something to an exponent of two multiplies its own number to itself, pentating something to two tetrates its own number to itself. So five pentated to two is that monster. And interestingly, we do know that the last digit of that would have to be a five, because the last digit of any power of five ends up being five. But the first digit is something so difficult to compute that I don't know if humans will ever know it. The massive size of all these hyper operations beyond just exponentiation makes it so something like pi tetrated to four is so hard to calculate details about that for all we know, and we have no reason to suspect that this would be the case, but for all we know, it could be some fraction or whole number because it's so hard to compute any details about. Now, instead of looking at pentation and beyond, what if we looked at tetration, but with an infinitely tall stack? This is my unofficial way of writing that. More formally, we might write something like the limit as n approaches infinity as we tetrate a to n. Well, two or three or four will obviously spiral up toward infinity. But one, even if we make an infinitely tall stack of them, stays at one. So are there any other numbers maybe in between one and two that converge to some finite value, even if we make their tetration stack infinitely tall? There are, and one fun example is the square root of two. Now, if you're not comfortable taking things to exponents like that or don't understand that, just trust me or your calculator here. If you take the square root of two to the power of itself, we get somewhere around 1.63. If we take it tetrated to three, meaning it to its own power to its own power, we get slightly higher. If we tetrated it 10 times, we get pretty close to two. And the more we stack, the closer we get to two. So the limit as we approach infinity of them stacked is two. And with the right values tetrated infinitely many times, we can even make a convergent result a bit higher than two, but not higher than the maximum convergent value, which is E, the classic irrational number around 2.7-ish. That's the maximum that any tower like that that's infinitely tall can converge to without diverging up toward infinity. And if you thought it was weird that the number E popped up there, you're not gonna believe this. The range of values that we could tetrate infinitely many times and have it be a convergent finite value is when that number is between e to the power of negative e and e to the power of one over e, or about 0.066 to 1.44. Above that as our value, and we'll diverge toward infinity with the infinitely tall stack, and below that it'll do a divergent thing as well. But in that range, it'll make some convergent finite result, even with the infinitely tall stack. And that's the last whiteboard I brought in here, but I think it stopped raining now. So let me head back outdoors to my combo classroom to tell you guys about our last tetration topic of the day. All right. Oh. That's fine. I can't draw this next topic on a whiteboard anyway. So let me just explain it. One last cool thing tetration can do is tetrating complex numbers. Numbers that are partially real and partially imaginary. And don't worry if you understand what it would mean to tetrate a number like that. You can just take a peek at these beautiful fractal patterns that are generated when we tetrate a complex number and color code it as to how fast it diverges toward infinity at certain points or doesn't. I couldn't make these pictures myself. I don't know how to. These are a few from Wikipedia, and they're similar to the fractals that we get with the classic Mandelbrot set, which takes a certain type of exponentiation in the complex plane. So as we can see, tetration can do a lot of cool things. Thank you for joining me here today in and out of combo class to learn about some tetration and the further hyper operations, and I'll see you next class.